Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, so today is our uh, inaugural uh, seminar after the summer break of these uh, online seminars uh, in collaboration between uh, AI de Potsdam and the Warsaw String Theory Group. And today we are, have the pleasure to have Mario Flori from Jagiellonian University, and he's going to tell us about geometry of complexity and CFT2. So Mario, please take it away. Okay, many thanks for the introduction and for the invitation to give this talk um, about my work that I did uh, very recently together with Michael Heller. Um, to be honest, recently I gave a very similar online talk uh, at uh, the virtual seminar of IFT, so uh, I hope um, no one has seen that before, otherwise it would be kind of like a doubling. But um, I guess there's a lot of people that haven't. So uh, today I'm going to talk about the geometry of complexity and CFT2. So um, there's going to be a few parts to this talk. I'm going to first uh, explain what is complexity. I think for this audience that's um, very well known. But nevertheless, I'm going to explain it a bit. I'm going to talk about holographic complexity. And then we're going to talk about like complexity on the Verso group and, you know, different proposals that have been made there. I'm going to talk about the kind of geodesics and curvature in our specific model that we studied. And then I'm going to talk about the relation to wave equations that have been recently uh, discussed in this context before closing with a discussion and outlook. So first of all, what is complexity? Um, so the idea is that suppose we have a quantum computer and we want to compute an output state psi um, from a reference state R by implementing a unitary operation U such that this equation holds. And you know, if you read about uh, quantum computation and quantum algorithms, you know that usually this is done uh, as like, um, um, by acting su successively uh, on this reference state or input state with a series of quantum gates that are picked from a set of allowed gates uh, or allowed operations. Usually we have to make sure that that set is uh, universal such that every U can be uh, approximated in that way. So U is written in this form and then, you know, in, in a graphic form, it might be written as this where H, the Hadamard gate would be an element in this set, for example. And in quantum information theory, like proper quantum information theory, this is known as the problem of exact synthesis. Um, how can I write an operation U in such a sequence, um, ideally using as few gates as possible, i.e. in an optimal sequence. So there's a number of very nice papers by John Yard and co-workers that I recommend if you want to get into the more mathematical um, quantum info side of this. Um, but um, you can also simply take a, like a group theory perspective, which for example in this holographic complexity area has already also been done in this paper. So imagine you have a finite gate set and imagine this gate set is invariant under inversion such that for every gate uh, the inverse is also in the set that just simplifies um, our life a little bit. And then this gate set generates a group capital G. And then for example, you can draw this so-called k graph where you have a vertex that is the identity element. And then by applying any element of this gate set to the identity element, element you go to a next vertex that corresponds to that group element. And then you have vertices that correspond to group elements that can be phrased as a sequence of two such gates and then vertices that correspond to group elements that can be phrased as sequences of three such gates and so on and so forth. And this calligraph can be topologically non-trivial for example like this vertex might be equivalent to this one if one group element can be phrased as a sequence of gates in, in multiple ways. Um, so this is very interesting. Um, and then for specific operation U, which is a group element, finding the optimal decomposition U in terms of these gates is kind of like, like finding the optimal path from that vertex that corresponds to U to the identity um, element vertex in this graph. Um, and that's kind of related to this word problem. How do I phrase this uh, group element, any random pick group element as a sequence of, of elements of this um, generating uh, gate set. Uh, 
And for example, um, you can look at finite groups um, where some results are already known. Um, and a very nice example is the Rubik's Cube, which is, you know, this little toy that I think everyone knows, um, where you can, you know, you can turn all the faces in various ways and then you can mix the cube and you can solve it again. So um, a, a finite gate set that allows you to generate all the possible operations on this cube would be all the turns of each of these phases by 90 degrees clockwise and counterclockwise. So you can write down a, a, um, a generating set of this form with just 12 elements, two rotations for every phase. But we know that the entire group of this object is much, much bigger. So you can generate a very big group with very few gate sets and then um, each possible state in which this cube can be corresponds to a group element. Um, and um, how easy are these to solve? There are known algorithms that you can apply to the Rubik's Cube in order to solve it. And it's known that uh, each um, configuration, no matter how mixed, can be solved in less or equal 26 steps. So despite the enormous size of this group, um, um, every kind of group element can be phrased as a sequence of at most 26 elements of this generating set. So in a sense, that defines very nicely a notion of complexity of a group element or of a, of a state of the system on, on which these group elements act. So that's kind of a very nice introduction, I think. And now we can come back to this more complicated idea of quantum information theory, where we are usually interested in a finitely generated group, uh, G, which is embedded into SUN because we are dealing with unitary transformations. So we make the following definition. The gate complexity C of U of this uh, operator U is the minimal number of quantum gates from your gate set uh, that have to be applied to implement this U, maybe up to a certain error tolerance. And the complexity of, this, of the state Psi with respect to a reference state R, so we write C of Psi and R, is the minimum, uh, the minimal complexity uh, of any operator U such that U maps um, the reference state to the output state so that this equation holds. Um, so you can imagine that you have your, um, your, your Lie group, SUN, which is like a manifold, and um, <clears throat> the finitely generated group G and its Kalec graph are in a sense embedded into this group manifold in a very intricate and fractal way, such that the vertices um, are dense in this group uh, manifold. Um, uh, and that's a very complicated problem. But as mathematical physicists, when we are forced with a very complicated problem, we often tend to simplify it to an extent so that we can uh, work with toy models that still uh, capture a certain aspect of the problem we want to solve while being overall more simple. That's the reason why so many people work on quantum gravity in three dimensions, I guess. Um, and um, one way how you can make your life more simple is that you completely forget about this kind of um, discrete uh, gate sets and uh, um, uh, discrete groups that they generate, and you look directly at this Lie group manifold, and you define a um, complexity measure as a geometric distance notion. So geometric complexity is when you take this uh, manifold and you define a smooth distance measure on it, and then uh, according to this distance measure, you can calculate a geodesic curve from the identity element to the operator u, and the complexity of u is defined to be the um, distance between the identity element and the operator u according to this distance measure. This is the idea of Nielsen. Um, so that brings me to the second part of the talk, assuming anybody has questions about this fundamental idea of complexity. Are there any um, questions? Mario, I have a question. Yes. Um, in, when you map to the geometry on SUN, mm -hmm. are you, you said you were simplifying things are you somehow losing some information by doing this or you're just recasting the problem in a different language? Well, I mean, in a, uh, in a, in a sense, you can lose things. That's why Nielsen in his paper, I think, proposed this kind of com geometric um, method only as a tool to get bounds on the real complexity, so to say. Um, especially one, one difference is uh, if you do it in the smooth way, 
you can always find um, a geodesic uh, probably from, from the identity to any operator U, exactly. You don't need to define this kind of error tolerance. The error tolerance is really only important if you have this kind of discrete set of points that's embedded into this manifold. And then once you find a point in this Kelly graph, which is close enough to you, you are satisfied with that. So that's a kind of a difference there. Okay, so you're somehow taking some kind of continuum limit or something like this? Uh, in a sense, yeah. Okay, okay. So it kind of simplifies our life and then we can apply all these powerful methods and tools of geometry to it. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, any more questions about this part of the talk? Uh, are there any limitations on the size of the groups? For example, finite, infinite or like that? Well, okay, so um, in this example, uh, you're working with SUN. And um, if you have in your quantum computer, let's say M qubits, then the unitary operators here are elements of SU2 to the M. So this uh, number N here depends uh, exponentially on the number of qubits. Um, but uh, you may also be interested in like the limit of infinite dimensional um, uh, Lie groups, and that's what we are going to look at in this talk, actually, because we're going to look at the Rousseau group, which characterizes uh, two-dimensional CFTs, and that's an infinite dimensional group. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Yes, I have. I have a question, Mario. Um, in the discrete case, the original discrete case, do you ever have to worry about? Um, balancing your um, your choice of minimum error or sorry ma ma maximum error versus um, the uh, number of gates you have to use in order to construct you so I could imagine a situation where you can use fewer gates but by some accident you end up um, getting closer to some particular state but that's a rather you know, not the universal characteristic. Like if you choose some other state, it might be something else. Sure. Um, I mean, if this operator U happens to be uh, like a vertex that's already very close to the identity in this Kelly graph, then, you know, that's, that's the ideal case. That, that means your life is very simple. The generic case is that in order to exactly get this U, you might have to go infinitely deep into this Kelly graph. And that's why this error tolerance is important because it means that, you know, uh, in a sense, you can uh, stop at, at a finite, uh, after a finite sequence of gates. I see. And it's not, it, it, it's, it's not uh, generic, like, if I were to keep decreasing my uh, maximum uh, error tolerance, that, you know, sometimes I might have to go much, much deeper into the Kaler, Kaley graph and then by some miracle, at some point, it might be periodic that actually I can go not so deep in the Cayley graph and then it might oscillate. Not, not, nothing weird like that ever happens. Um, I'm not quite sure. I, I wouldn't expect it to be the case generically, that's clear. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a very interesting topic because essentially you have this kind of Cayley graph, which is like a, you know, at a certain depth, there's a finite number of points and these points are embedded into this manifold. Mm -hmm. And for this gate set to be universal, uh, essentially what that means is that if you go to this Kale graph and you map it to infinite depth, all the vertices in this embedding need to be dense in the group manifold, in a sense. Yeah. And um, now you could ask yourself the question, like depending on your generating set, whether there are, um, in a sense, uh, depending on the depth, whether there are bald spots on this manifold. Like let's say I plot all the vertices as a cloud of points here. Mm -hmm. Maybe one generating set has um, the points such that already at a certain depth, they are very homogeneously spread and there's no big gaps in the manifold that are uh, where no point is. And maybe there's like another gate set, which is also universal, but where the cloud of points is very concentrated in one area and leaves a, a big bald spot, so to say, on the other. Yes. Um, I, get, I think that would be very interesting to, to characterize whether, whether things like that happen and for what kind of gate sets they happen. Um, 
but I'm not an expert on that part of the story. Thank you very much. That's the reason why I like to work with these, you know, simplified geometric things because geometry is a tool that I think I, I have a better grasp on than a lot of these. Like, I mean, if you, I, I really recommend these kind of papers because they are very uh, exact and very much motivated from the quantum information theory perspective. The papers by Kliuchnikov and Yard. And uh, there's a lot of like number theory um, that goes into these calculations and their results. Um, so um, for me, that's simply not the kind of uh, tool that I am most uh, familiar with. So that's why I work on this more geometric side of the problem. But I agree that this is potentially a very interesting kind of uh, question to research. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, any more questions? Not about the first part? Good, good. In that case, I go on to the, the second part, namely the holographic complexity, which, you know, originally I came from the side of holographic duality and ADS-CFT research. Oh yeah, and I should explain this picture um, is kind of a artificial Einstein-Rosen bridge that was built here in Kharkov, close to where I live on a, a playground. So, um, if you ever want to see such a thing in real life, you can go there and you can send your children uh, crawling through there and see whether they come out on the other side or not. Um, I'm bringing up the Einstein-Rosen bridge here and the geometry of such an Einstein-Rosen bridge because that's the kind of context where in holography we first became interested in complexity measures, namely in, in black holes and their properties. So um, this basically goes back to ideas of Susskind and in fact, there are two proposals for um, how to compute a measure of complexity of the state uh, that's encoded in this uh, bulk space time according to the holographic um, uh, dictionary. So the first one was the complexity equals volume proposal, which says that, you know, if you have like a fixed time choice on your boundary where the CFT state lives, then you have to calculate the extremal surface that spans from that boundary into the bulk. And the volume of that surface is going to be a measure of the complexity of that state relative to some um, um, potential reference state, according to this conjecture. Another proposal is the so-called complexity equals action proposal, where you have to construct this so-called wheeler de Witt patch in the bulk, again, depending on at what time you're looking at your uh, field theory state. And then you have to evaluate the bulk action on that wheeler de Witt patch, taking into account all the various boundary terms and counter terms and such like. And then the conjecture is that this value would give you a measure of the complexity of the dual state. And then obviously this has been applied to uh, like black hole space time. So here you see the, the, the sketch of a, a Penrose diagram for like BT set black hole in three dimensions. And um, well, I became very interested in this and I wanted to study these volume, uh, these complexity proposals in greater detail. And especially I wanted to put them to the test. So how can you do that? Um, one idea is to look at um, infinitesimal local conformal transformations in ADS3 CFT2 and see how these complexity measures of the boundary state change under such transformations <clears throat> in the bulk. Um, according to these two proposals, um, th because then you can compare these two proposals with each other and you can compare them to your expectations from the field theory side, because on the field theory side in a CFT, we know precisely what kind of operators implement such uh, local conformal transformations. So for the CV proposal, um, together with Nina Mietlai, I did um, calculations about this volume change um, and so these were bulk calculations, which we published here. And then in a later paper, uh, I say later because it was on the archive later, but these numbers here refer to the uh, time when they uh, were published in, in the journal. <clears throat> but in, in a later paper, then it was shown by a field theory calculation entirely on the CFT side that these results match exactly with, um, well, the field theory calculation based on a complexity proposal from this paper. So that was, I think, a really strong result because um, before that, these holographic complexity conjectures were kind of, uh, in a sense, vague and hand-waving. They weren't uh, 
as well defined as, for example, the uh, Hiyotaka and Naki formula, let's say, where we know precisely what entanglement entropy is on the boundary also. So this matching between these two results, I think, was very, very interesting. Um, that's for the CV proposal. For the CA proposal, um, I did the calculations in a later paper by myself, which came out in 2019. <clears throat> And as I said, you have to uh, take into account a number of terms that add to the action there, which were worked out very nicely in this paper by Lena and others. And there I found that the, the behavior that you get according to this proposal in the bulk is kind of in contradiction with what you could get from a sensible um, field theory complexity proposal along these geometric lines um, on the boundary. So in a sense, I claim this shows a contradiction between the CA proposal and this idea that it's dual to a Nielsen complexity on the boundary. So also I think this is a very interesting result. Um, a similar kind of philosophy was followed in these papers concerning the first law of complexity, where they also looked at the change of bulk complexity measures under a certain um, infinitesimal change to the field theory state, but they looked at a different kind of change. They looked at one that turns on a scalar field, so to say. Um, and also uh, generically the idea of, for, of complexity for symmetry transformations uh, was studied in this paper by um, Javier Magan. So um, I think we have a number of interesting results now on the field theory side and given, uh, sorry, on the, on the bulk side, on the holography side. And given that this is the case, uh, I wanted to return to the field theory side and understand that better again. So um, the question is, can we extend, especially the question is, can we extend these kinds of uh, results beyond the, the leading order in these infinitesimal local conformal transformations? And that's essentially what motivated my work then with, with, with uh, Michael Heller. So um, the next part then is gonna be about this complexity on the VSO group. Unless there are any uh, questions about this uh, second part of the talk so far, no questions about that? Good. Um, so as I said, the third part is gonna be about this complexity specifically on the VSO group, or as an alternative title, you could call it geodesic motion in infinite dimensions. So how does that work? Um, first of all, um, um, let us um, define the VSO group, um, which we can do following like the brief introduction that was given in this paper or the very in-depth uh, explanation in this thesis by Oplak. <clears throat> so we look at the orientation uh, preserving diffeom diffeomorphisms on the circle. So we have a map F that maps an angular coordinate sigma to F of sigma, such that this periodicity condition is uh, satisfied and also the, um, the derivative should, should always be positive. Um, so that ensures that um, it's orientation preserving and also the map has to be invertible. So the group operation is just like this. So that you apply F of one to F of two of sigma, uh, F one to F two of sigma. The identity element of this group obviously is the identity map F of sigma equals sigma. And the inverse function of F, the inverse group element is given literally by the inverse function. Um, and then technically to get the real so group, you have to add the central extension uh, in such a manner where you have these kind of uh, elements that are uh, real numbers. And here you have this, in this kind of uh, uh, group multiplication law, you have the appearance of this bot co-cycle. So this is kind of the technical introduction. Um, and now what we call a circuit is a path on the group manifold parametrized by tau. So remember every map of this form F that maps the circle to itself is a group element. And so a circuit is a, a function F of tau and sigma such that for every value of tau F of that value and sigma is a group element. And the unitary operators we can uh, um, write in this kind of form as a path ordered integral with these generators Q. And the generator uh, can be written um, in form of the energy momentum tensor or like one, one, 
like uh, one of these uh, components of the energy momentum tensor because we're working with one copy of the Verso um, group so far. And you have this function epsilon of tau and sigma here, which is related to F and its time derivative according to this formula. And is kind of like a tangent space element in the, in the Lie group. Um, and for the moment, we ignore the central extension. So um, having written down these kind of um, uh, expressions, we can go on and try to define complexity. So following this paper by Caputa and Magan and also a later one by Edmenger, we assume that this circuit um, uh, U of tau acts on a reference state R such that we have a tau dependent state that is U of tau acting on R. And now we make a um, convenient choice for the reference state R to be an energy eigenstate of the CFT2 on a cylinder um, corresponding to a primary operator with a chiral dimension H so that R equals H. And we also introduce this kind of um, um, generator Q tilde, which is just um, obtained by operating with the inverse of U and U um, on Q. And then um, based on this expression for Q that we have here, if you just write this out and you know all the transformation laws, you can uh, obtain this formula for Q tilde which is still given by this energy momentum tensor, but now you have a term that corresponds to the Schwarzschild derivative here. And you have this curious combination um, that appears as a prefactor f dot over f prime. And you should keep that in mind. This is where it comes from. And this is, um, um, this combination will um, um, appear throughout the rest of the talk very prominently. The, the benefit in defining Q tilde is that if you want to calculate expectation values or two point functions, um, then by definition, the expectation value of, for example, of Q tilde square in the state H is the same as the expectation value of Q square in the state psi of tau, and the same for the one point function. So, having introduced that, we can um, now deviate from um, the, the kind of complexity measures that were studied in these two papers. And instead look at the so-called Fubini study metric or the fidelity susceptibility. So suppose we, this is our state, psi of tau equals u of tau acting on R. Um, for an infinitesimal d tau step, we can kind of expand this um, um, product here or the absolute value of the product. Um, um, in this way, and then this quantity here is known as the fidelity susceptibility, which acts as a kind of metric on the space of states. And um, in the appendix of this paper, the form of that was, the abstract form of that was already worked out, and it takes this form. So it's given by the uh, connected part of the two-point function of Q tilde evaluated in the state H. And now we can add some technical calculations if we just plug in this um, definition of Q tilde to this equation here, um, um, we obtain this expression here where now we have the two point function of the energy momentum tensor T. We have these combinations of F dot over F prime here. And this two point function for the state H, we can look up in the literature, it takes this form. Um, uh, well, so this is the, uh, so, this one minus this squared uh, appears here. And having said that, we are now led to this complexity measure that Michael and I proposed to study in our paper. So this is this Fubini study cost that we associate with the circuit F of tau and sigma, which we assume to go from tau equals zero to tau equals one, and which takes the form, the integral uh, over d tau, essentially the line element the square root of g tau tau. And then plugging in these explicit expressions that we obtained, it takes this form where under the square root, we have a double integral over d sigma and d kappa, these two combinations f dot over f prime. And here we have this kind of two point function, um, which concretely takes this form, but as much as possible, we will leave um, this function pi here um, in this abstract notation. And we will only make use of the concrete form of pi when we have to, just for the sake of generality. So this is what we 
took as our definition of complexity in our two papers here. Um, the Fubini study caused as a complexity measure was uh, motivated um, in, in this paper by Chapman and, and Michao and others. And it also kind of plays a role in this paper by Berlin and others. And as I said, we will treat this function pi as a general function as much as possible. And then we kind of set out to study the, the kind of properties that this kind of com complexity definition would have um, and the consequences that would follow from it. So um, first of all, I want to kind of discuss how this is analogous, uh, analogous to a geodesic problem in standard uh, differential geometry. So um, essentially what we are working with is we are, we are working in infinite dimensions. So um, suppose you have kind of a Lagrangian or action for a, for a geodesic motion in a, in a curved space time where you have the metric G sigma kappa and you have kind of the tangent vectors x dot sigma x dot kappa, both as a function of tau. Now these discrete indices sigma and kappa, which in the finite dimensional case would just run from one to the number of dimensions, we replace with continuous coordinates sigma and kappa that are um, ranging from zero to two pi, such that the summation that is implicit here is replaced by an integral. The, the coordinate of the, of the kind of particle x sigma of tau, where tau is the affine parameter along the geodesic is replaced by f of tau and sigma, so that x dot, is replaced by f dot. And uh, in a sense, if we take this kind of uh, uh, identity or this kind of analogy, then the metric g sigma kappa here is replaced by this uh, expression in our model. So we see that um, the problem we study is very similar to geodesic motion that we know from general relativity, just in um, uncountably infinite dimensions. Um, and we can, can make use of this. For example, when we solve the geodesic problem, we know that um, essentially we can drop the square root and uh, equations of motion will, that are derived from the, from the Lagrangian here without the square root will be equivalent to the one from, uh, derived from the Lagrangian with the square root as long as we assume a fine parametrization. Um, and we can do the similar thing here. We can essentially drop the square root. And as long as we are um, um, assuming a fine parametrization, uh, we are essentially still working on the same problem. Um, the, the solutions to the equations of motion will still be the same, um, but the equations of motion take a simpler form. So this is um, um, what, we, what we did. And then we have obtained the equations of motion in this form, um, which is, we are this geodesic analogy similar to this kind of form of the geodesic equations that you know from your standard differential geometry textbooks. Um, so let me give a few comments about these equations here. Um, as you see, one integral is, is left over d sigma. So this is a second order integral differential equation of motion instead of a PDE or ODE, it's an IDE that kind of adds a few complications but it's because um, we are working effectively in infinite dimensions. Look at this here, you have, um, you have a summation over this index mu, and because of this geodesic analogy, the summation over the index is replaced here with the integration over the coordinate sigma, so that's why it's an integral differential equation. Um, as I said, this function pi essentially defines our metric in this analogy, However, there's one problem that we're gonna uh, have to face, namely that this metric in the specific case that we are using here is gonna be a degenerate metric, as I'm gonna explain uh, soon, and hence it's not invertible. That's the reason why the geodesic equation here is written down in this form. I mean, probably you are more used to it uh, without the factor G here and the Christoffel symbol here, that's easy to obtain if you can contract this whole equation with the inverse of the metric. But if the metric is degenerate, no inverse exists, and that means you have potentially a problem. Um, so this is something we have to face. It's a technical difficulty. 
but I'll explain where it comes from and I'll hopefully convince you that it's actually a very neat feature of these equations. So um, this problem poses a question about the unique, uniqueness of solutions to this equation for given boundary conditions. Um, and we will resolve this by employing the symmetries of the system. So this is what we do next. Um, but maybe um, I should pause for a second and ask whether there are questions so far about this. No, no questions? So everything is, everything is clear? So on your definition of U, uh, maybe this is a very naive question. So your U is expressed in terms of energy momentum tensor. Is there any motivation for that? Like, sorry, Q. Like why, why are you considering energy momentum tensor here? Um, that's just the way it turns out if you look at the CFT. So um, the point is that, I mean, you know how these kind of conformal transformations act on states. Yeah. And um, like you can, okay, if you have to use, you can um, uh, derive your Q in this form. And then very naturally the, the, the real so generators show up. And uh, obviously they're the modes of the energy momentum tensor. So this is how, this is precisely how the um, conformal transformations are implemented in a CFT then. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Okay, good. So, um, so now that I have set up this problem about the degeneracy of the metric, let me show you how to understand that and solve that. So, as you might have noticed, this function here, that specific function that we use, uh, has poles whenever sigma equals kappa. So potentially we have problems even evaluating this integra these integrals here to begin with. And we need to find a way to regularize these divergencies. And one very elegant way to do that, we found is by differential regularization. So, um, uh, which was uh, discussed in a number of papers in the 90s. So what we do is, um, we phrase this function pi here as derivatives acting on a, another function with, with a milder singularity that can be integrated over. In this case, it's like a log of sine uh, sigma minus kappa half squared. And then we assume that um, these functions, these expressions that show up here are very nice and smooth test functions. And we assume that in a sense, the finite value of this integral is defined by pretending that we can act um, uh, with, with integration by parts on these derivatives. So we write psi as derivatives acting on a function and then we integrate by parts to let these derivatives act on these test functions instead. And this integral here can be given a finite value um, f dot over f prime is a very nice smooth test function. So derivatives acting on it are also smooth test functions. Everything in the um, bracket here is a nice and smooth test function. And if we integrate that against this function here, it still has a pole, but it's a very mild pole that can be integrated over. So this entire integral here can be given a finite value. And we essentially, by differential regularization, define this value to be the value we assign to this integral that we are uh, pretending to work with. And this differential regularization is the cause of the degeneracy of the metric, as I can show you very easily, because this expression here can be zero. For example, if f dot over f prime happens to be a constant, then clearly all these derivatives acting on f dot over f prime are zero, and then clearly this integral is zero for any C and H. Um, more generically, um, sorry, more specifically, when H equals zero, um, what you have here in this, in this uh, square bracket is essentially like a differential equation for F dot over F prime, which happens to be solved by sine of sigma, plus a phase that doesn't matter. So for, for H equals zero, 
specifically, this kind of combination would also make this integral vanish. Um, so this uh, means that this metric can be degenerate depending on what the values of C and H are. And um, this is related to the subgroups of the real soul group. So for, for this case, where f dot over f prime is constant, that corresponds to the subgroup that's generated only by L0, the real soul generator L0. And uh, in this more specific case, um, we, in addition to that, have the um, subgroup generated by L0 and L plus minus one. And those are precisely the subgroups that kind of transform the state H only by a complex phase when acting on it. So what this means is that our, and this is kind of a physically important um, realization, our notion of complexity does not assign uh, a complexity cost to transformations that only generate a phase on the state they are acting on, which is specifically this reference state H. And this is generically something that people tend to um, expect of uh, sensible complexity definitions. Um, and that's a problem that uh, uh, Johanna Erdmenger and her uh, co-authors struggled a little bit with in this paper, where they found that the complexity measure they studied there did assign complexity costs to states that only change by a phase, um, which in uh, generically uh, we just don't expect because we expect that, you know, the phases, that the states are only important up to a complex phase. So in that sense, this degeneracy of the metric as much problems as it might cause is actually a nice feature to have. And that's- Sorry, Mario, I have a question. So yes, yes. in this slide, you are already choosing some particular pi, right? Yeah, I'm choosing the specific pi that comes from the, the two point function. So at this point, it's not general. Okay, okay, uh, but do you but, know like for what kind of choices of pi you would get like this? Uh, uh, well, my, my expectation is, I mean, this, 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 this case here is gonna be uh, zero whenever you use differential regularization in a sense. Like whenever you have this uh, structure with um, uh, derivatives acting on f dot over f prime, if f dot over f prime is constant, that's gonna be zero. So I think the generacy of some sort is a generic consequence of the use of differential regularization here. And you know, later on, we're gonna talk about the, the what was it, the hunter sexton equation, uh, where also, is, in a sense, you get a similar kind of degeneracy, right? But so, so generically, you're saying that all these pies, they, with arbitrary choices of pi, you can use this differential regularization, or there are some pies no, where No, no, it, it depends. Okay. If your pi is a very nice smooth function, you don't need differential regularization. If it has poles, you may try to treat them with differential regularization, depending on how strong the poles are. Um, and then, you know, depending on how strong the poles are, you may need various like orders of derivatives. For example, in this case, we have like up to like essentially fourth orders here. Uh, if you would set equal c equals to zero and only look at the h-dependent part, that the pole is milder and we only need second orders in derivatives. So, like if you have very strong poles, then you might have an arbitrary number of derivatives acting here. But is there some guiding principle of why you, you know you should have poles or should not have poles in this pi? Is like why? I mean, it's, it's uh, well. I mean, yes. it, it, it in this Fubini study approach, it naturally arises as a two-point function. Right. So uh, two point functions often have poles at the kind of coin. Okay, well, I mean from, from like complexity or geometry or complexity point of view. Um, well, I mean, again, I would say we believe intuitively that it's good when, you know, the, 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 the metric can be degenerate because then it can assign zero complexity to these kind of uh, subgroups that only generate a, um, uh, complex phase. So if you ask me this, then I would turn the logic around and I would say um, if I want some operations to be assigned zero complexity, I need it to be possible that the metric can be degenerate and hence uh, differential regularization is a good way to achieve that. Maybe this is getting uh, like a circular argument. Uh, okay, thanks. 
Okay, good. Uh, more questions? Okay, so um, so this is a very nice result. Um, and um, in fact, it gets better. It gets more complicated. Um, we also looked at uh, symmetries of our Lagrangian, you know, searching for um, potential conserved quantities. And there's a funny thing that happens. You can show our um, Lagrangian is invariant under shifts of this circular coordinate sigma just by a constant delta sigma. And then for generic pi, you can calculate um, the conserved charge that corresponds to this uh, symmetry, uh, which takes this form. Now, in the specific case where we use differential regularization, such that pi can be written as derivatives acting on another function, and we integrate by parts, uh, you see that this charge here automatically vanishes because, that, because of the del kappa derivative, which after integration by parts in this expression acts only on one, the factor one that you can add. So this vanishes identically. So why does the charge vanish identically in this case? Because this formerly global symmetry in that case turns into a uh, local symmetry or gauge symmetry. So we can show in this case of differential regularization in an abstract sense, um, if f of tau and sigma is a solution to the equations of motion, then so will be f of tau and sigma plus alpha of tau. So we shift the sigma coordinate in a time dependent way around the circle, we wiggle it so to say, for any function alpha of tau. So this is a u1 gauge symmetry. What you can imagine is that you know there's this kind of space of maps, and you have a geodesic that goes from your initial map to your final map, and um, you have this kind of alpha here, and you can wiggle um, this uh, this solution around the circle in an arbitrary time or tau dependent way as you go from A to B, and it's still a solution of the equations of motion. So this is like a gauge symmetry that emerges in that case. So that's a very interesting and neat feature. And um, fixing this gauge symmetry addresses the degeneracy of the metric um, and allows for unique solutions to the equations of motion. So essentially you need to have a gauge condition. And if you implement that, then in a sense you, you project to a base space where the equations of motion are not, uh, where the metric is not degenerate anymore and where you can solve your geodesic equations uniquely. Um, so as I showed you earlier on, for h equals zero, this kind of degeneracy of the metric is enlarged to this kind of DSL2R subgroup. Uh, and in this case, um, uh, we also get a PSL2R gauge invariance. Good. Um, so um, that brings me to the fourth part of the lecture. Uh, are there any questions so far? about the previous part. Uh, how much time do I have left? Um, about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, very good. You can take a couple more minutes uh, to wrap up after that, it's fine. Okay. Uh, no. So go ahead. Yeah. Good, good. So um, let me talk about this topic of geodesics and curvature, which I think is very interesting. Um, so, um, now that we have this equations of motion, what do we do with it? Um, suppose we want to calculate a geodesic uh, circuit f of tau and sigma from some initial map f of c of sigma. Uh, sorry. Oh, that's that's bullshit. Uh, sorry. Uh, this is a typo. It shouldn't be c or it should be sigma. Uh, we want to go from the identity map to another map. This is, this is a typo. Here should be sigma. Um, to, so we go from the identity map to um, this kind of target map, which let's say is um, just of this form with epsilon uh, small so that we can do perturbation theory in it. So we can do that and then we can calculate this kind of circuit order by order in epsilon and it takes this form, it's rather complicated. And for this example, the square distance uh, if you evaluate this integral, it takes on this form again as a CU6 punch in epsilon. Um, so for one specific um, kind of 
geodesic, this doesn't tell us very much. So let's try to study this, um, the underlying geometry in more detail by studying its curvature. So instead of solving the equations of motion for, for more examples of specific boundary conditions, uh, we can gain a generic understanding of the qualitative features of the geometry uh, that is imposed by our metric on the group manifold by calculating sectional curvatures. So for example, we can do that by um, probing uh, geodesic triangles. So here you kind of have a triangle study uh, span between this identity map, here it is correct, and like two, uh, two target maps. And then we calculate the uh, geodesic curves that connect these uh, three points. We calculate the angles between them at each point. And the sum of angles in the limit where epsilon goes to zero is pi because locally the space is flat. So that makes sense. But then, you know, the first order correction in epsilon tells us something about the curvature of the space. Um, because for, for geodesic triangles, for example, on a positively curved space, we expect the sum to exceed pi. For the negatively curved space, we ex expect uh, the sum to be uh, smaller than pi. So in this case, we get that in this specific tension space that we studied here, we get a negative sectional curvature for H over C smaller than four over 13 and a positive one for H over C uh, larger than four over 13. Um, so this is one specific geodesic triangle that you can study. You can uh, kind of do this calculation in a more um, generic way. So um, where F dot at CO sigma, is essentially like a tangent vector. So we look at tangent vectors, sine of m sigma and sine of n sigma. And um, we can calculate the geodesic, uh, sorry, the sectional curvatures in these kind of tangent planes. And we get a very complicated kind of ugly result. Um, some specific values are given here in this table for um, the case where h equals zero. And what we see here that these are all negative. Um, are you? Yes. One question, why are you using the sign? It's just easier for the calculations. In a sense, it's like choosing a base in the tension space. Okay, okay. Um, but um, so here, what we find is that these uh, sectional curvatures mostly turn out to be negative. And in fact, even for generic C and H, this is something that we can show, at least in these tension planes that we can probe in this basis that the sectional curvatures are mostly negative. Some are positive uh, always, but in a sense, the most of them are negative. And this um, kind of phenomenon is well known in the study of such systems and it's tied to the sensitivity of the geodesic problem to initial conditions or essentially some, some form of chaos, um, which was already like pointed out by Arnold. And um, also by Brown and others, it was written uh, or explained how or why we expect sectional curvatures generically to be negative um, in these kind of models of computational complexity. So finding this result was also very nice for us. Um, that brings me to the last real part of the talk. Um, any questions about the previous one? No? Um, good then, so um, let me talk about this relation to wave equations because um, PDEs on the Virasol group or the group of diffeomorphisms without the central extension uh, can be derived in this kind of framework uh, that was developed by Arnold and which is kind of, we call Euler-Arnold type equations by defining uh, right or left invariant inner products on the Virasol algebra. Um, there's this very nice textbooks that explain this. So essentially you kind of define this um, inner product um, where the Verso inner product uh, is written as the sum of this inner product on the um, uh, algebra of the diffeomorphism group and uh, the term that corresponds to the central extension. And then you get this kind of expression here and you take that as a kinetic term for a geodesic, so to say for a particle that moves on this group manifold. And then this leads to equations of motions of this form here. Essentially, V is like a tangent uh, space element in this algebra and uh, corresponds to this epsilon that we defined earlier. So as a reminder, this is how epsilon was defined. And you can rewrite this in this form where capital F is now the inverse of F so that this holds. Um, 
and these kind of equations here are very well known. Um, for various numbers of uh, alpha and beta, you get these well-known integrable equations that have been studied, studied as wave equations, like the kamasa holm hunter sexton equation or the Kodrick de Vries equation, which is the most famous one, and which was already uh, kind of uh, suggested as a possible complexity model in these papers here. And um, um, so this, this kind of poses a number of questions, like what kind of complexity is defined by such equations? Uh, when does this kind of equation star arise as a two-point function? Because the point is here that this kind of inner product here with a generic pi uh, fits very well to the um, thing that we defined earlier on. Uh, just that in our case, pi was motivated to be something more complicated than this combination of direct deltas. Um, but so when would, uh, for what kind of uh, group transformation or two-point function would equations of this form um, arise uh, as a two-point function? Um, which equations of motion uh, from this set here are in a sense the most realistic models of um, complexity? And what results from the math literature that exists on these can be applied to real so complexity concerning, for example, exact solutions that you know can be found for these equations which happen to be integrable. The results on curvature also interesting things like conjugate points or geodesic completeness. So um, uh, as a specific example, I'm a fan of the hunter sexton equation, um, which as you see only has this term here, which has two derivatives. So that corresponds to the case that we had earlier on where we used differential regularization. So in a sense, this hunter sexton equation is gonna model uh, um, um, a kind of complexity with a similar degeneracy than we have in the case for generic non-CO H. Um, and uh, uh, there's this very nice paper that studied this equation and the underlying geometry, and they found that the, the underlying geometry actually has constant positive curvature, uh, sorry, curvature, which is not what we would expect from a, a, a intuitively uh, well, um, good complexity model. And in fact, the geometry is that of an open subset of a sphere. So that means that, um, and there are no conjugate points, but in a sense, the space of invertible maps is statistically incomplete according to this um, uh, geometry. And uh, um, these circuits can leave the space of invertible maps in a finite affine parameter tau. This is, uh, if you interpret these equations as wave equations, that's related to the phenomenon of wave breaking, you know, when the, when the wave profile gets infinitely steep, so it's not an invertible function anymore. But in the complexity context, um, I find that hard to interpret. So I think it would be interesting to study, like for which of these kind of equations and whether for our kind of equation, such wave breaking happens and how that would be interpreted in a complexity context. And that would give us an idea of, in a sense, which complexity models are the qualitatively um, most uh, sensible ones from a complexity point of view. Um, so that brings me to the discussion and outlook. Are there questions about the previous part? Okay, um, I'm sorry if it was a bit rushed at the end uh, because of the time. This is the last slide. So as a summary in these two papers, we studied one natural way of assigning complexity to the VSO circuits, in our case, based on the Fubini study distance. Um, we, dis we discussed some mathematical properties of this definition, especially this connection between differential regularization, degeneracy of the metric, and then gauge invariance and CO cost for complex phases, which I think is a very uh, interesting and important uh, kind of connection. We discussed solution approaches for the equations of motion and um, the, the, the sectional curvatures, which are mostly negative, as we showed. Um, all of this fits in this broader framework of the euler arnold type equations, uh, or as, as Michael likes to call it, the con same conceptual umbrella. Um, and then uh, I agree with Pavel and Kavi and Johanna and others that, in, in fact, these kind of equations might be interesting to study in a complexity context. But I think our work raises a number of, e of questions that you could ask and that you could use to decide 
which of these types of wave equations are the most realistic models of complexity. Like uh, uh, when do these kind of integration kernels arise as two-point functions? Uh, when do you have like positive or neg negative sectional curvatures or um, issues concerning the geodesic completeness of the problem? So um, having said that, 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 that was the last slide now. And I would like to thank you all very much for your attention. Um, and of course, um, I would also be very happy to answer any questions that are left over about this. OK, thank you very much, Mario, for this very nice talk. Um, we already had several questions uh, during the seminar, but we have time for a couple more. So can I ask you a question? Um, of course. Hi. Yeah, I can. <laughs> so uh, yeah, maybe this is general. So in general, like the, one of the reasons we are like interested also in this complexity story is that we we think that it may have some more fine-grained information on the top of entanglement in, in ABS CFT, for example. So entanglement is not enough. Yeah, right. So, 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 but still, like in this Biorazor context, it seems like we're like in a kind of universal sector of CFT, right? So, so do you think that, uh, you know, from your studies or stuff, you can actually learn something beyond the entanglement entropies in this set of states? Or it's more like, you know, general question. I don't know. What do you think? Or maybe this is, we need something more complicated to see that this complexity is fine grained or already this set of gates and, and, and state in, in the universal sector of CFT is enough to, to study these differences between entanglement and complexity? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, so far, uh, we've, uh, I mean, in these two papers, we've essentially kind of uh, left the, the bulk behind and focused on the boundary. So we only looked at one copy of the Rousseau algebra. If you already want to look at two copies of the Rousseau algebra, it gets uh, uh, more complicated. And that's uh, one potential um, area where these uh, results that we have diverged from the ones uh, from Billion and, and others. So uh, that's non-trivial already. And um, yeah, beyond that, I mean, if you want to look at like, let's say the actual black hole, then you have two boundaries and then it gets even more complicated. So uh, from our point of view right now, we can't say anything about uh, that yet. Okay. So we focused like on the, on the, the field theory side exclusively in a sense just to understand it better and get a better feeling but it's true that there's like a lot potential open questions and further directions as there always are okay thanks uh, sorry and and maybe do you uh, one more question do you see like some kind of connections with these proposals for free theories let's say you know, using this Gaussian uh, Gaussian states, for example, by Rob and Ro, uh, in a sense that, of course, you can also study that in some free CFTs. Uh, so uh, can, you, can, you, can you see, like, if this, uh, if you can choose pi in some way that ma that kind of is closer to what are their proposals or something like that? I haven't thought about that. Um, maybe Michael knows more. Um, in, in our paper, we discussed a little bit about the difference between the left and right invariant metrics. And we argued that I think the right invariant metrics are kind of more in line with that kind of proposal. But beyond that, we didn't uh, think much about it. OK, thanks. Any other questions? No questions? Well, OK, if there's no more questions, we thank uh, Mario again. Thanks. And OK.